great innovation stories make change possible. Each week on the Innovation Storytellers podcast, I invite innovation leaders to share how they overcame the obstacles to introduce breakthrough ideas to the world through the power of story. I'm featuring guests from Tesla, TD Ameritrade, Corning, Cisco, Bloomberg, and so many more. Listen in to learn how you can tell a more effective innovation story and change the future for the better. Hey, everybody. It's Susan Lindner. I am back with Innovation Storytellers and super excited for my guest today, David Rose. Now, if you don't know David Rose, please allow me to be the first to introduce you to David Rose. He is a five-time entrepreneur, an MIT lecturer, author, and expert on digital product innovation, computer vision, spatial computing, and IoT, the internet of things, how all beautiful things in our home connect and at work connect via the internet. He is a futurist at EPM Continuum Prototyping with new products and service concepts that exploit emerging platforms like AI and AR and VR, wearables, embodied interaction, and effective computing. And if you don't know what all those are, you will by the end of the show today. Right? PhDs for everyone, David. That's what I say. (laughs) He is also the author of Enchanted Objects, Design, Human Desire, and the Internet of Things, not to mention the brand new book, Super Sight, which is in a beautiful stack right behind David, if you're watching us on YouTube right now. And today we're going to be talking about the journey of innovation storytelling around all things internet, certainly the internet of things, and how we move great products and services from idea and concept using great stories to their inevitable finish line. So having worked on any number of incredible products with patents to boot, things like photo sharing and interactive TV and ambient information displays, medical devices, and machine learning algorithms. I think many of us just want to crack open David's brain and just take a walk around inside there for a while and see what see what cool things are popping up. So with no further ado, David, thank you so much for joining me on Innovation Storytellers today. Oh, it's great to be here. I'm excited for the conversation. Yeah. So We always begin with a walk down, I guess, David Lane today. (laughs) And um, tell us how you got to your career in innovation, because most of us don't graduate with a degree in innovation. In fact, for many of us, that I don't even think that's a major that exists. Yeah, I think my story really starts with, as an undergrad, I was a double major in physics and fine arts. I was kind of unhappy to just do one discipline. I've always been a bridger of disciplines and kind of curious about the world of that is between the traditional disciplines. I'm also a singer and done some professional voice training and sang with the Boston Symphony Orchestra. And I, it's interesting like how understanding the technical, the design and the emotional, psychological side of projects and kind of being able to pivot your own uh, view of those back and forth has been useful across many, many products. So, I mean, when I wrote Enchanted Objects and was doing many prototypes with kind of trying to hack furniture in my home, <laughs> kind of making my my wife and children experience like a Google Earth coffee table where you'd have a map and it would res- and you'd have a nice big view of the world or a a doorbell that would that would let you know when people are on their way home or you know other kind of ambient information objects. It was always this like, what is technologically possible? What is aesthetically acceptable into the home? And then what does that do to family dynamics and conversations? And, you know, psychologically, what does it allow you kind of open up in terms of new potential for ways of living? So anyway, I've, I've always been interested in kind of the bridging of, mul- of multiple worlds. But for, in terms of like being a student of innovation, I think kind of the most important place that I've experienced was to be a student at the Media Lab in the early 90s, where there was a really a culture of demo or die. At MIT. Yeah, at MIT. So you really couldn't go very far with like pontificating about what the world might look like. There was a real culture of like, well, okay, that's kind of an interesting idea, but why don't you just go build that already and then learn from making really low fidelity, but kind of working prototypes and 
exposing those to not only yourself, but your the mates in your lab or sponsors who are walking through every day that were obviously going to have kind of opinions about your hacking Lego bricks and trying to make Legos more sentient so that you could build little robots or have a construction kit for robots or Guitar Hero where you know we kind of wanted to make the experience of performing something where you didn't have to like just slave away at learning guitar or cello for two years before you got that sense of, oh, I'm contributing, I'm on stage, I'm part of a band and riffing together. And so that experience of prototyping and learning quickly, I think was really important. Okay. So I'm just going to stop you there because we've covered like 16 concepts in the span of your, uh, you're only at university, right? You're only at MIT at this point. So (laughs) a couple of things. One is this I had a great conversation yesterday with a woman named Natalie Nixon, a fellow anthropologist and design thinking creativity maven, who I hope to have on the show very soon. But this idea, and I, I think it's true for many of the guests on my show, is there's a combination of dual forces at work within the creative, innovative mind, right? Things like you were saying, physics and Fine arts. Yeah. Right. So I'm thinking like you're thinking about paint at the molecular level, but maybe not. Maybe it's more like Calder mobile and the kinetics that are taking place. I'm a mobile freak. So I I could put a mobile in every room if someone let me, but, (laughs) but, you know, just thinking of this balance, even of how we incorporate our own unique interests in innovation is actually one of the drivers of innovation. So I'm curious about that. I know my very first intern that I hired at my company was a double major at Yale in electrical engineering and opera. That was her focus. And I was like, you're the smartest person in this company <laughs> as my intern. And I just want to see what you can do because I know that those that peanut butter and chocolate creates some kind of beautiful alchemy that we can see. The other thing that you mentioned is that way that MIT Media Lab was famous for just go freaking do it that ethos was still a precursor before there was lean, before there was agile, right? Lean startup, lean enterprise, agile development. It was all, well, we'll go prove it. Go see if you can do it. It harkens back to the greatest of inventors who said, I'm just going to give it a shot. And then I think about professors walking around like Tim Gunn in what is that runway show with Heidi Klum, who's just walking around going, I don't know those sleeves. It's kind of like, I don't know if that equation really works. What was that like being in that space and going, just freaking build it? Yeah. Well, I think we have a better name for that today, which is sacrificial prototypes. Because Ooh, it's a, I've never heard that before. Uh, sacrificial prototypes. Yeah. So a sacrificial prototype is one where you try, because of the name sacrificial, like you're going to throw it out. Ooh. So don't be too precious about making the radius is perfect on the water jet cut, or maybe you don't have to use a water jet. Maybe you could use a laser or a bad 3D printer in order to like just quickly make something in order to learn. Hmm. So David, you're a five-time entrepreneur, right? You have gone in, it's a disease, right? I mean, it's infectious. You often give it to other people. You cure yourself of it by selling it or, you know, allowing it to go public. And then yet you dive back in for another dose each time. Right. Mm -hmm. I know um, many of my fellow entrepreneurs feel the same way. So can you talk us through a little bit about the chicken and the egg of creating the innovation and then building the company around it? And then that arc, what does that look like as you're prototyping, building, and then scaling And the stories that you tell along the way to the investors, the new team members, to get them on board with this crazy ass idea that you're bringing to the world. (laughs) I think you, I mean, my favorite way of thinking about like what the entrepreneurship journey is, I feel like you're trying to build kind of four docks at the same time, board by board, that are all trying to like form in the, to meet in the middle of a lake, let's say. And you keep running around to different to, and the four docs you're trying to build is one is like, what is the product going to be? And how do you prototype that? How do you do a looks like prototype, a works like prototype? How do you understand what how much it's going to cost? And then you run around to the next side of the lake and you talk to your potential customers 
And we're thinking about building this, like, what would be your reaction? Would you buy something like that? You know, you do the customer research in order to have insights. And then you run around to the next part of the other side of the lake. And you try to bring team members on and you say, look, we found these customer insights and we have a little bit of a product, but we need your help in order to build it, in order to flesh it out. And you're the perfect person in order to come onto this team in order to help us lay down a couple more boards on the product dock and the getting to customers dock. And then you run out to the fourth side of the lake and you tell investors, hey, so we have these customer insights, we have this product, we have this amazing team, it's all going to happen and you want to be the one to help bring it to market for these reasons. And then you run around to the product side of the dock and you like start all over again. And you're, you're like, every day it seems like you're trying to lay one more board down on the make it real aspect of all four of those things that you need in order to make everything come together. Well, and you forgot the marketing doc entirely, right? Which is just like, ah, it. you know, and because once it's built, right, then it falls into the camp of folks like me who are just trying to spread the word and get some diehard missionaries for the product out into the world. Sorry about that. That's okay. My son so, came in. <laughs> that's all good. Welcome to life at home. <laughs> so what about that storytelling journey, whether it's to get the product team on board once you hire the engineers to actually build the darn thing or, you know, that next level of trying to get people on board with the concept and the idea of something that they can't even conceive of necessarily. Yeah. I, I mean, more and more, I believe that the hardest part of being a product innovator is to only pick one beachhead market at a time mm. because inevitably like we're working on an, an augmented reality experience for boaters right now so it's called clearwater.ar and it allows you to hold up your phone and see the underwater topography like the topo lines as if you're in a flat bottomed boat and you had a yeah, glass yeah. bottom boat sorry yeah. so if you're a boater and you want to avoid hitting rocks, or if you're a fisher and you want to find the breaks and the holes and all of the features, the underwater structure in order to become a, be more productive as a fisher person, then you desperately kind of like want to see under the water and want to see through the water in order to gain this information. Or if you're a boater, like a Freedom Boat Club member, and you've never been on Boston Harbor before, those channel buoys are like a half a mile apart. And so like going safely around Boston Harbor to Pedex Island is a really actually pretty hard problem. And you're, even though there's a, like a little Garmin chart plotter on the boat, like you're just like, you're like, I don't know how to use that marine electronics thing. I'd much rather have a phone where I can just hold up the phone and see through the camera on the phone and see augmented paths, like a yellow brick road kind of paths that are on the surface of the water, like ways would show you for roads or show me the virtual buoys that I would be able to see on a clear day. But now that it, the fog has rolled in, <laughs> like you can't see the buoys. I mean, the hardest part of the, of building that there's the technical challenge of anchoring augmented reality objects onto wa a water plane, which is hard. But then there's also just the marketing a kind of product discipline challenge to say, well, is this really for fresh water or is this for salt water? Is this primarily something that's fun to do, kind of Pokemon Go style of like pick up all the lighthouses in Boston Harbor? Like, is it a game? Is it a serious boating safety tool? Or is it for people who fish to be more productive because they understand the world around them in an entirely new way? And we, we're kind of getting feedback from the market from all three of those, <laughs> those potential customers that it's really compelling for all three of them. <laughs> and, and it's really yeah. hard to just pick one compelling storytelling worthy use case. You know, that was always my, you know, series A round was go for three. You know, let's mm -hmm. like pull the handle on the slot machine and say, we're going to come up with three different ones, three different lines that we might follow and see which one kind of hits first, but then also has the price point, the viability, the longevity of the market, et cetera, that we feel really invested in, that we can make these folks really happy over time. And we can make ourselves happy in servicing that community, right? Because mm -hmm. you might find that 
lawyers, accountants, and educators all need that one service that you're offering. But your desire to work with lawyers indefinitely might not bring you joy. No offense to any of the attorneys listening, but <laughs> I love my attorney. Maybe that's not even the market that you'd like to go after. And with time, you find that they're reticent to invest in new technologies anyway. Whereas the school board, they vote yearly and you have one shot of getting in. But you know this other group of accountants, they're always looking to be dynamic and unique. There's sufficient competition in the market that requires. So like part of that process of figuring out who your number one target market is, is also listening to the stories from within the company, I think, and also outside the company. What do you think about that? Yeah, with Clearwater, it's been really useful to work with a company who I hope will acquire the company <laughs> because they're a big... If you're listening. <laughs> I mean, Brad, they own uh, Boston Whaler. They acquired Navico, which is an, a mapping company for a billion dollars last year. They own Mercury Marine. They own Freedom Boat Club and want to promote boating. So it's helpful to, I think, have a relationship with somebody who knows a lot about the category and also can help provide feedback on of these three use cases of fishing, safe boating, and fun. The safe boating one, because Freedom Boat Club owners are new to boating and new to the places where they're boating, and that solves a big problem for market adoption for that customer. We've picked that one as our number one because we have a, a go-to-market partner who we can kind of see that that resonates most with them. Nice. Nice. Yeah. So even like maybe the total market, the TAM evaluation for people who fish might be 8x, 20x bigger than the new boating, the zip car of boating, boat rental market. We still are kind of listening to what's the most urgent need that we're solving with AR for water based the water metaverse. <laughs> I love the way you described it. I mean, just thinking about that story is imagine being on a boat and having a yellow brick road, regardless of weather conditions, guide you to the best possible path to your destination. I think it's a beautiful metaphor. I'm, I'm always interested in the story side because what will it allow us to connect with? And just to pick up some of those really interesting story elements, that yellow brick road is something we connect with as kids, right? We can mm -hmm. see Dorothy and the Tin Man on it while you're telling the story. There's a certain level of creativity that allows you to yeah, think about it. But you're that. right. It's kind of like I'm summoning a fairy tale in order to, for you to understand a new technology. That's what great storytelling does. You know, it allows yeah. you to, I always talk about incorporating the five senses into a storytelling because it hits viscerally in the way that we understand and we can feel the story in our bodies which is really critical to allowing a story to stick with us. Mm -hmm. So if you can include the five senses and you can include sense memory from very early childhood, you have the listener already engaged mm. just by saying that word. Mm. So we're triggering all different kinds of that sensorial muscle, <laughs> right? Let me try another one with the five senses. I don't know if I can yeah. do it, but Please. the other AR project that I'm working on right now that I'm really excited about is trying to solve this problem of how do you get more people to invest in the climate change issue? And for many of us, like the buying trees in Brazil is kind of not visible to us, <laughs> to us. And kind of, it's hard to invest in something where you don't see the ramifications. So I've started working with a wonderful company up in Vermont that is 12 landscape architects and landscape designers who've been doing, who really know the trees and the climate zones and the natural pollinators and like all of the wisdom of being trained as a landscape architect. And they had a real passion for, could we try to really influence 50 million residential homeowners in America to get a shade tree in their yard or use natural pollinators that are good for the bees and the birds or constrict the lawn area so that you're not using as much water in California or you're not using as many chemicals. So that was kind of the problem. But the way that we're doing this is we're using AR so you can kind of have a magic paintbrush. So if you go outside to your home and you hold up your phone, we've already planted 
a beautiful, well-designed landscape in your yard. Like it's already there. You just have to go outside and reveal the new landscape that is already proposed for your, so we're proactively anchoring these things in people's yards. And then like a magic paintbrush, you can say, well, I'd really prefer a different color for this garden bed, you know, different dominant color. Like we might have picked your shutter color as a default, but maybe you say, no, I'd really like a complementary color to that. Or we picked a certain type of shade tree and you say, well, I really, I have the childhood memory of the smell of a pine tree and the sounds that a pine tree makes as the wind passes through a pine tree. So you use your magic paintbrush in order to swap out the oak or the maple for the pine. But this experience of kind of walking through the landscape as it's virtually imagined and then making it manifest by saying, oh, well, I would be happy to make these changes that you proposed, which may be a couple thousand dollars, but it will en enhance the value of your home. It will bring you a lot of pleasure and it will help you capture a lot of carbon. And if you can do that, 50 million times 2000 is like a hundred million dollars in climate change investment. So that's that project. It's called Home Outside. You know, it's fascinating. I would, you know, since you and I first spoke, I saw a, um, a new segment in Compton, California of recognizing how much shade has diminished from really densely populated urban areas. And there are local activists on the ground who are seeing climate change start at home and recognizing that the paucity of parks and natural resources for those in urban areas is having a direct impact, not only on home values and on the lives of those individuals, but on climate change as well. Mm -hmm. So recognizing it as a vital part of childhood development, urban renewal, like, and sustainability within a community, not to mention health. I mean, part of their promotion is also to plant fruit trees as part of even an economic incentive to ensure that garden beds bearing fruit and vegetables or even just a lemon tree it could be a game changer. And suddenly yeah. the lemonade stand pops up outside of that house in Compton, not just the lemon tree, you know? Mm -hmm. So like all well, these kind of tiered benefits happening. Yeah, that's great. I mean, I think one of the things that I think AR, the, the subject of my book, Supersight, kind of the conclusion is, well, why do we need new eyes? Like, why do we need our eyes to evolve? If you think about the animal kingdom, a lot of it is about... Oh, wait, sorry, David, one second. Tell us a little bit first the premise of Supersight. I was going to do this, but I'd much rather hear it from your mouth. So what was the impetus for writing Supersight as we're envisioning a whole new world, just like these front yards, mm -hmm. you know, and, and creating this new sustainability? But what was the impetus for writing Supersight? And can you give us like a top level view of the book? Sure. So the book really covers the capabilities of computer vision and augmented reality. So the impetus for doing it was really thinking about our visual system as something that can evolve with technology. So I see all of these, like an Apple watch, an aura ring. These are all, I think of them kind of as prosthetics, like they give the human body more abilities. And if you think about the mixed reality glasses that are coming or the hold up your phone and you know, mix the view of the world with augmented layers. I was really thinking of it as kind of an evolutionary question of like, what do we need to evolve to see as humans? If you look at the animal kingdom, the way that visual systems for fish or for owls or for you know almost any animal have evolved is to see your prey at night or see a predator in order to escape. And I thought, do humans need more visual acuity? Like, do we need to see further away for food? Like, not really. <laughs> we actually, we probably need diminished reality in terms of our food choices, not augmented reality, because we don't need to see- Like, I need Godiva chocolate bars at every checkout counter at- <laughs> You mean, you mean to obfuscate, to obfus like to mask those? I need to block those. Exactly. <laughs> right. Exactly. Right. I need that. Yes. <laughs> we don't need better vision for food or for predator or, or prey. But one of the really blind spots that we have, and behavioral economists have, have talked a lot about this, is the ability to kind of see the future, to see the longer term consequences for short term decisions that we might make. And so there have been some experiments that Fidelity has done around like, well, how do you show someone their, their long-term future self in order to 
get them to save more? Or how do you show a smoker kind of what you're doing to your skin or people that are carrying around too much weight, what you're doing to your joints? Like, how do you make those, the ramifications of this kind of longer term consequence more vivid? And so that's really the premise of the, of Supersight is how do we help people with this kind of failure of imagination problem that if you look at a parking lot and you think, well, I don't know, I can't really see what this could be, but a city planner or an architect or somebody who is in schooled in reinventing space can look at something and say, oh, I can see exactly what this could be. You know, this could be a beautiful pocket park. This could be a an event space. It could be a canvas for art in the city. But, you know, mere mortals, <laughs> most of us who aren't schooled in that need this kind of assistance to help us see these things. And I thought, well, this is what AR should really be put to work to help us do is to be able to look at a, at a landscape and say, here's a sustainable version of that landscape, or to look at a city street and say, here's the safer version of this intersection or the more pro-pedestrian version of that world. And kind of once we see it, that's very powerful. And people will invest in those things that they can imagine and have conversations with other people with those things that they can imagine. So I really see it as like this kind of imagination engine. Hey, it's Susan here. Like what you're hearing so far? Make sure you never miss an episode by clicking the subscribe button now. This podcast is made possible by listeners like you. So thank you for being here. Whether it's your first time or you're 10 episodes deep, if you want to learn more about me and the work that I do with innovation leaders, head over to susanlindner.com for more information. I'm always open to a conversation to learn how I might better support you. But for right now, let's get back to the show. Oh my God, I love that. From the storytelling side of the equation, we talk about innovation storytelling as painting a picture of the future that others can't see yet with words. But you're talking about the picture being worth a thousand words, in this case, a million words, because you've already designed it. On this show, we often talk about how the prophets, Jesus, Buddha, Muhammad, they were able to paint a picture of what a future and an afterlife would look like and a certain series of behaviors that we can enact here that would make life better for everyone. And they could paint that picture with such clarity mm. so that we would say, yes, I believe you. I'd like to follow you. Right. And change okay. your life and really change okay. your life. And I think there's a difference between the picture that includes you or it's of your current situation and context versus the one that's just abstract and doesn't include you. And so I was at Warby Parker for a couple of years and leading the vision tech practice at Warby Parker. And when we put virtual glasses on people's faces using the iPhone 10 camera, which allows you to unlock the phone with your face, we had a very, very accurate and realistic projection of this is what these frames are going to look like at the right size, appropriately placed on your nose bridge. And we know your pupillary distance and we know the width of your face and your complexion. Then we could really make this very vivid, believable view of what these glasses are going to look like. And people would feel confident enough to just to buy off of this kind of face filter projection. Right. Not even just one yeah, pair yeah. of dollars glasses, but a $500 investment sight unseen, which was unheard of. And I have to ask you, are those well, so it, on the cover of your book too? <laughs> um, <laughs> they are. Yeah. Do you want to know what go. the, <laughs> yeah, I heard these glasses. So, yeah. What are these? I'm just trying to remember the, oh, Winston. They're Winston oh, style. Yeah. So there you go. Yeah. <laughs> one for Warby Parker for you. Yeah. <laughs> but how amazing, right? Designing that technology and then suddenly just opening our very limited imaginations. It's not that humans don't, it's just, we're thinking about lots of other things. So when you suddenly ask me to switch gears and envision what glasses are going to look like on my face, if you can do that for me, then I'm there. Right. I mean, it's a hard problem in shopping for almost anything. Like you go and you look at a display at a store and you think, oh yeah, I'm really going to like that coffee table. I'm really going to like that China, or I'm really going to like that. Those skinny jeans, um, <laughs> skinny jeans. Yeah. Whatever it is, like you see it on a model and you might fall in love with it, but people make lots of bad choices if it's not in context. 
still a bad choice. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think about the things that you see in a, in a store where you see all of the colors and you like fall in love with the rainbow. And then you ultimately like you pick one color to buy that pin in or whatever you're buying and you bring it home and you're like, meh, it's a pet. Like what you really loved was the display, not how it lands in your life in context. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's what's powerful about AR is the ability to kind of understand whether it's your face or your body or your lawn or the city, and then really redesign that context in real time and allow you to experience it. Yeah. And a very interesting use case too, right? I mean, compared to just talking about the Warby Parker example is this is a very confined context, right? I mean, I don't have to see myself glasses at a party, glasses at home, talking to my kids, glasses, like it's just my face. Like it's a beautifully self-contained mm. little. But it would be stronger. That's a good idea for a future Warby Parker try on experience, which is like, what do I look like if these glasses and candlelight? And what do I look like in, in harsher lighting? And what do I look like in hiking outdoors? And it would be nice to be able to simulate for you nine different contexts and show you your face with those glasses in that context too. Mm-hmm. I wonder if that would be a support or a deterrent. You're like, well, these look really great in the office, but they look really awful at a party. It would drive That's exactly places. right. That's exactly right. So you're like, but you need Warby to say, these look great in the office. You should consider these for going out on a date mm-hmm. on a Saturday night. Right. <laughs> Maybe a little more cat eye. Maybe a little yeah, more. <laughs> yeah. I think that is what's happening as these technology ma- products kind of mature. We want more specialization. Like we want multiple risk. We m- want w- multiple watch bands for our watch. We right. want multiple glasses for our booze, different types of wine glasses or cocktail glasses, you know. Yes, it tastes different in every glass for sure. (laughs) You go to a bar in Belgium, every single beer has its own glass associated with the brand. So, and every beer manufacturer makes a glass for its beer, you know. Yeah, I think there's something our technologists can learn from that because I think it's often a misconception that there's one right design. Like that there's a Johnny Ive kind of perfect laptop or perfect Apple watch or perfect, whatever the category is that I love this, the book by Kevin Kelly called what technology wants makes the parallel to the way to think about the future of product categories is to look at a coral reef and ask like, is there one fish? Is there just one type of fish that evolved in order to be the fittest fish from a Darwinian sense on a coral reef? Like, no, it's hyper-specialization, increasing diversity, increasing specialization. And if you look at any product category that's mature, whether it's wine glasses or shoes or watches or glasses, like there's giant proliferation and specialization And the same, I think, will be true of our interfaces with the world, with the web and with the data services. Like, will I have a pair of glasses that can also be AirPods? Of course, because you want open ear audio and you want, you know, when you're in a new city, you want to hear the city and you also also want the walking tour. So, of course, you're going to have a pair of glasses that has technology in the temples of the glasses. Will you have another pair of glasses that show you where the fish are when you're fishing? Like, well, why not? Like, so I feel like, they're asking the question about like, well, will it be the phone that's the primary interaction with the digital world or will it be the watch or will it be glasses with full mixed reality versus partial mixed reality versus only audio? The answer is like, of course, all of the above. Wait, so I have a question about that because we're all diving into the metaverse and whether we want to or not. And I think it's, A, I think it's just hysterical that, a young man named Mark Zuckerberg who had like probably the worst social EQ back in in the day when he was designing these systems, if the movies are accurate, right? The guy did not have a lot of game, did not have a lot of social skills. And yet he's designing our social universe, right? He's designing the way that we interact with one another. And it sounds like over time, we are going to be driven more and more into a virtual world rather than the one that we currently inhibit, inhabit rather that leads us into a set of new goggles that we're not even, I mean, I could be bumping into people and not even realizing it because I'm so deeply into my metaverse reality. 
what is that vision? And from an augmented or virtual reality perspective, what's it like? David, I just feel like you're probably closer to this than any of my guests have been. How do you see that playing out? Yeah, well, I do see that it, we won't only be drawn into these VR synthetic environments with other people, like what Zuckerberg is kind of conceiving of as metaverse all the time. I think it will be great for certain types of experiences. There's a company in London, I think they're called Gather, and they do events for like Morningstar and other financial services companies that can afford it. And they basically send everybody an Oculus who's coming to the event. And then that's the only thing the Oculus is programmed to do. So it doesn't work. It doesn't do anything else, except at the time of the event, everyone puts them on and there they are. (laughs) And they're like, they're a single one use thing. And so I think like that's an interesting model for, you know, one reason that we might want to be in a is VR that, situation is for a conference. Sorry, is that yeah, just watching a conference? Yeah, it's just it's just for like a 90 minute conference session, right? Yeah, yeah. I think there will be if you're designing something or virtually previewing market real estate or you know, I can think of like a dozen use cases where being completely immersed in VR is preferable. And then we can think of other things where and to me much more compelling is the mixing the real world, which I love. And (laughs) most of us find joy in in the real tangible world around us. And thinking about making, adding another set of layers on that world to learn and to train and to purchase and to uh, experience and make will really change how we interact with technology because it's AR, not just VR. But some of the things that, that Mark is doing, I think, I mean, the investment will be overall really positive for the community because there are problems that Niantic, for example, the makers of Pokemon Go are solving with the new Lightship product, problems of, you know, how do you synchronize multiple people's view of the same physical place at the same time across platforms? Or how do you have a spatially anchored persistent world that If you make a move to the world and then I come back, I see the thing that has moved, sort of like a real-time map of the country, for example. Or how do I quickly copy-paste from my phone into the world, from the AR world into VR, from VR into onto paper, you know, like the ability to kind of move seamlessly between these representations of reality, I think is one of the biggest opportunities and problems to solve. And I think Facebook has a reality labs, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people are working at Facebook reality labs. There are hundreds of people at Google that are working on some of these kind of interaction issues. And I'm glad that Facebook has triggered this kind of investment in helping to experiment with and solve some of these problems that I think we have to for the community. See, I think that's a really grown up way of answering that question, which I appreciate. But my son just graduated with a degree in video game design from RIT. Hmm. And the amount of time that he spends on the internet as a game designer, right, is one thing. But the desire for the rest of the world that lives out here is shifting because the ability to control and manage, you know, that space on the internet feels far more comfortable to someone who spends so much time in that space and developing make believe worlds that. I don't know for a younger generation if we love it out here is going to be the same response to, I really love it in here. And I remember a younger me on Sims or those kind of create your own universe worlds. I mean, someone just got married in the metaverse, right? Someone also just got sexually harassed in the metaverse. You know, like those experiences of us as humans are traipsing over into that place because we can't help ourselves. We're going to bring all of our foibles with us to this new place, good and bad. And so it's just curious to me about the choices that we'll make about what's the time that I want to spend in the new place. It's kind of like the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Like how much time will we spend walking through the wardrobe? Narnia, yeah. Yeah, Narnia. Well, Narnia is a pretty awesome place. Like, I don't know if I would ever go right. back to the so my, that's my evil about. uncle if you've got Tumnus right there to hang out with. That's what I'm talking about, right? So But it sounds like you're worried about the pie chart of where people will spend time and 
Yeah, in the book, in Supersight, I kind of, I propose six kind of existential hazards of this coming world. And rather than just being alarmist about it, I, I, try, I try to propose a solution for each of the six, you know, what we could do to address the problem of social insulation that happens when everyone who's walking around has a different view of what's in front of you. Yours is diminished, so you don't see the good yeah, eye of chocolate. That's the political universe at the moment, right? Yes, Where right, has a different- yeah. And how bubble, fractious that bubble, is. Bubble filter problems, right? Yeah. Or the kind of business model of pervasive persuasion, which I think a lot of people are very afraid of kind of data privacy. And if these giant cloud companies know even more about where you are, who you're interacting with, what you're talking about, where is your gaze falling? And even subconscious things like what is attracting your attention and your gaze is dwelling on certain things in the world. And you wouldn't even know at the end of the day that that's what has been bright and shiny and attractive to you. But now they know, and that can be retargeted to you in every medium. So like no escaping it. Yes, that's right. That's right. Right. Like you should always wear those skinny jeans, Susan. They look phenomenal on you, right? Like there's no getting out of it anymore. (laughs) Right. And not only can you tell how you subconsciously react to, to things, but also how the people that look at you, whose gaze falls on you, are subconsciously reacting to these things. And so there's really this interesting <laughs> opportunity for synthesizing all of this data. And the synthesizing, I think, I'm especially worried about Amazon's kind of cloud fusion future, because since they acquired Ring, who is putting cameras and doorbells, I mean, so is Google putting cameras and doorbells, the view of the city that can be surveilled from city cameras to personal cameras that we're choosing to put there and sharing those data feeds with our neighbors. There's a feed of who's walking into your home, what are you doing in your home, what are you buying? Like if you were to design a surveillance state, (laughs) you would build Amazon. (laughs) I mean, Amazon kind of already has access to all of the data feed. What are you watching? Like if you look at across all of their businesses, that's the company that seems to have the most kind of views of how you live inside of what you're searching for, but then also all of the other things you're doing throughout the day and what you're talking about and that kind of thing. I know they're not actually listening to all of my Alexas, at least I trust that they're not, but there's so many other cues that are offered by the way that you talk to your Alexa, which is like your, what's the prosody of your speech? Like how sing-songy is the, you know, what's the variation in, in pitch for your speech, which is a leading indicator for, um, for depression. And if you talk with like low affect, then you're probably more likely to be down. So it's the pace of speech. It's the prosody. It's the sound of coughing. It's the respiration rate. Like all of those things are sensible, even just as you're asking to put on a timer. And in well, you could say, well, that's a wonderful ambient data feed for a healthcare service. And I think I would agree with you, but I think we really have to use privacy by design principles in order to allow people to understand what's being gathered and blow it away more easily to say, please forget everything you ever learned about me now. (laughs) May the court disregard the previous statement. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Right. I mean, and God knows what other implications it would have. I mean, we could extrapolate out from Alexa, how do I clean up spilled blood? You know, like, (laughs) right. What's happening there? What's getting recorded there? So yeah, I think there's some hope in edge cameras or edge devices that where all the processing is local and things aren't shared with the cloud, which you can do as a design architecture, a product architecture, but most don't. Hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, this is some super site into stuff that um, perhaps many of our listeners haven't yet experienced. But I think one of the glories of working in innovation is being able to work on things that are three and five years out that haven't necessarily made it into the consumer's hands, right? It's fun being Mm. at that, at the edge, so to speak, and bringing those things to light. So let me put you on the hot seat for a minute, David, and ask you a couple of questions that I ask all of my guests. So If you could have been on any innovation team in the course of human history, which innovation team would you have liked to have joined? That's a very good question. I think I'll say Apple Watch. 
because of the intimacy of something that's worn and the design variability of what you could do with the screen on a wrist. And there's so much tradition and heritage in watch design. It's something I've just loved for so long that there's you know, a million choices to make about the trade-offs and how thick should we make it? What's its battery life? How big should we make it? Is the variability in the design of the screen versus the design of the band? How many sensors do we put on the back of it to test EKG or pulse oximetry? Or how do we use it to make people breathe? There's haptic feedback when it comes to watches. There's a beautiful old watch that actually has an alarm that's purely haptic. And it just drives this a little pin. It's not sharp but just against your skin, between the watch and your skin in order to tell you that like, it's time to go do whatever you were going to do. I think it's like such a beautiful multi-sensory design problem. Like there's haptics, sense of touch for turn right, turn left. You could change temperatures of the watch. You could have the watch band constrict a little bit, like someone grabbing your hand. You could use audio. Like, and it's yet this very intimate object signals affinity to a tribe and history and fashion. And it's really a fusion of tech and fashion in a way that I think smart glasses will be as well. So that would have been a fascinating team to be on over the last eight years. And it's come to dominate like all, like if you look at the, how much is spent on watches in, in the world, like I think they are making more margin than all other watch brands put together. (laughs) And all of Geneva. Yeah, Um, right. (laughs) And I just like mine because it makes me feel like Dick Tracy when I used to read the comics as a kid. And that's what I enjoy about it. Okay. Are you using it for kind of real-time FaceTime conversations? Yes. Yeah, nice. I I am. Okay, so that's, which is the design team you joined? So if you could have designed anything yourself, like what's a problem that you find to be pervasive that you would just like to... Like if you could just fix this one thing in your life that makes you absolutely crazy, what would you invent? Car dashboards for me are like, just really need a total rethink. Oh, um, that's a I great one. All, everything I learned at Ambient Devices about pre-attentive processing and the types of cues that you can provide through a change in pattern or a change in color, the idea that you would show how fast you're going as two digits is so wrong. Like you're going 68 miles an hour. Like your brain, it takes like 20 times the processing power and time for your brain to understand 68 versus an angle and the angle of the of a tachometer or a speedometer. Yeah. Yeah. So we really need to go back to designing things that are using angle and color and subtlety, especially in these situations where we're not trying to get you to look away from the road for seconds and minutes at a time in order to figure things out. And even the most innovative brands like Tesla, they've taken away a lot of the cluster of the traditional cluster of tachometer, speedometer, odometer, that kind of thing. But they've put it into this screen, which now is like five layers deep. So in order to change the steering wheel heat or the back seat heater or that kind of thing. You have to go like nav, 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 nav. Like you have to do four taps in order to get to these things where it could be a lot more, the controls could be more distributed through the car. Think about the, who was it? Plato had this kind of idea of a memory palace where you kind of put memories into different spatial locations around the room as a way of remembering your speech, for example, like your soliloquy. And you could put control surfaces for like lowering the window on the window or heating the seat on the seat, or, you know, it could be like a double tap on the thing in the car. And there could also just be so much more inference that's made about if it's cold, like, yes, I want it to be this temperature. Like, why do you need a key for a car anymore? Why do you need, there's so many things that could work in a much more predictive and pleasant way and respond to you. Like one of the things I'm most fascinated about with with driving is if you have a camera that's looking at you, the driver, you can see whether they're paying attention, whether they're falling asleep, whether they're distracted, reading their phone messages. And then you could do things to change either the way the car works or the way that the environment works in order to 
you know, wake someone up if you're falling asleep. Like you could change the lighting to be cooler colors that are more energizing. You could change the temperature to be cooler. You could change the music. You could call a friend. Like all of those things could be recommended or triggered based on someone's affect. And I don't see car brands kind of using that signal in any kind of useful way. That's fascinating. I can imagine like just kind of dozing off at the steering wheel and suddenly Metallica comes on at full blast. You're like, wake up! Maybe it should first ask if you want Metallica, but... Yeah, right. Stop, wake up. That would be fine too, as opposed to be driving off the road into somebody else. (laughs) But I do feel like the social connections that a car might help you coordinate would be might keep you up more than Metallica too. Like if there was another stimulating friend that you like to talk to, who's like in a different time zone and it's late at night in Connecticut, that's a better solve. Fair enough. (laughs) Mine was more thrilling. (laughs) (laughs) David, this has been absolutely wonderful. So where can people find your books? Where can people find you to talk about, A, this new boating app that I'm sure a lot of people are going to want to get on board with? Yeah, and so I have a there's a new website called supersite.world. I'm innovating okay. on URLs. <laughs> so it's not .com, it's .world. And that has links to the book. It has like the first and last chapter that you can download as a sample. It has a list of inspiring projects. It has design principles in a Miro board. And it's a place that I think is could be really useful to kind of dive into some of the ideas in the book without actually buying the book. Or you could also buy the book. Please do. (laughs) (laughs) And David, you speak at conferences and corporations and things like that too around these. I do. I really love doing, I did a workshop yesterday for a a company that's in the martial arts space, trying to do like Peloton for martial arts at home, which was a super fun workshop. So I, I regularly do one day or three day or design workshops or office hours. I'm working on an office hours project for P&G right now about the future of oral care and lots and lots of great ideas around changing, using kind of ambient design principles for um, how we take care of our bodies. So yeah, those are fun engagements. And my speaker bureau is the Lavin group. So like I do keynotes at conferences and that kind of thing too. Fantastic. Well, it's just been an absolute joy having you on Innovation Storyteller today. Thank you for all the brilliant stories. And uh, we look forward to hearing more. Thanks, Susan. Thanks for a fun time. Now you might be asking, Susan, why innovation storytelling? Well, the truth is that an innovation story told well not only breaks down communication barriers so you can drive change and new growth, but it also helps other people remember and champion your work. And it propels your best ideas forward faster to secure you the runway, resources, and recognition you so richly deserve. In other words, stories are memory-making devices that significantly reduce the time it takes for you and your innovation to be understood. But like many leaders, you probably never got the memo that storytelling skills would be central to your success. Well, I've got some good news for you. It's not too late because I've got you covered. Whether you need an expert to come and speak to your innovation leaders, you need training in the art and method of innovation storytelling, or you just need the support and guidance of a consultant who can get you where you want to go in less time, visit www.susanlinder.com today to learn more and to set up a call to discuss your needs. I'm so looking forward to connecting with you and to helping you tell a great innovation story. If you like what you heard so far, don't forget to subscribe so you never miss another episode. And leave us a comment. Tell us what you think of this episode. We'd love to hear from you. And if you didn't like what you've heard, just forget everything I've said. 